Dr. Michael Geis is a psychiatrist committed to the practice of psychotherapy, integrating Freudian and Jungian traditions. His 30-year practice in Santa Barbara has included the teaching of psychotherapy at Antioch University and Pacifica Graduate Institutes. His preeminent focus is on how a relational reality between therapist and patient is the source of healing. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Geis. <clears throat> Good, and tell me if I don't speak loud enough, because I like to walk around and generally not hold microphones, but if you can't hear me, then that won't be, yes, that won't be good. So, um, it's always exciting for me to be here. What I do is I put a very loaded topic out, usually about four months in advance, and then I have to swim upstream <laughs> to find how to talk about it, and so, and once again, it wasn't until working four months that about two hours ago, my imagination just showed me the order of things to say. And I tell you, if you think that's easy, as, as the deadline approaches, it's not. So look, counter, counter transference was a term invented by Freud. So we're really going back to something important. But the idea of transference, something transferred, was from part of your past transferred onto the therapist. So <clears throat> that was the whole idea. You know, if you had difficulty with your father in certain ways, you might start experiencing a male therapist that way. But that was his idea. The word counter in front of it only means that it has to do with the therapist. So we could say the therapist's transference onto his patient. You get somebody that's a real problem for you, and all of a sudden it's very hard to stay open to them without a lot of your, your issues. You're with me with this? Are coming up. So let me start in the literature and give you a typical example from a, a very good analyst, Owen Rennick. And here's a typical example of how it can happen. Now, what's important here is that for the first 50 years last century, the whole idea behind countertransference was that it's in the way you won't be able to really hear and understand your patient. It's something that when you discover it, you need to go back into your own therapy and deal with it. So for fifth, first, the first 50 years, it's about, it's a real problem and do something about it. And here's a typical example of a very good analyst who, while he's sitting with his patient is aware of it, which is good, <laughs> and beginning to, to work with it to get himself out of the way. So this is a typical example. And I'm going to be talking for the rest of this hour about, about the usefulness of it, not what I'm about to share with you when it's in the way. So here's Dr. Rennick. In everyday clinical sequence, a patient is describing her joyless marriage. As I listen, I am aware of a sense of immobility. I'm sitting absolutely motionless in my chair, and my limbs feel heavy. Possible interventions come to mind, but I decide against them, one after the other. I have the feeling each time that I might say what I might say would not lead to anything useful. I note that the remarks I keep thinking of making all aim at a rather active investigation of my patient's situation, questions about her attitudes toward her husband and the future of their relationship, how she regards her options. But I realize I have an urge to rescue her from the marriage and end her distress. I realize I have an urge to rescue her. 
The feeling is a familiar one to me, reminiscent of, among other things, my childhood wish to be my mother's savior. All this is, so he's, he can sense this. This is a really good thing you can, when you can sense it. So we could summarize this vignette by saying that a piece of self-analysis led me to become aware of an omnipotent rescue fantasy generated by my own psychology, a fantasy that was not appropriate to my actual task as an analyst and my responsibilities toward my patient. The insight I gained was quite useful, keeping in mind it allowed me to avoid, avoid embarking on a mission of my own I might otherwise have pursued at my patient's expense. Okay, so that is what the field has been dealing with the first 50 years. And it's still important now if you're sitting with a patient and, oh my God, there's a lot coming up that's in your way. What are you going to do with it? So here is a favorite um, New York therapist of mine. Her name is Darlene Ehrenberg. And you see, Because the first 50 years got therapists really nervous about what was coming up in them, what feelings, images, thoughts, well, emotions were coming up in them, there was a lot of emphasis on don't say too much, don't reveal too much, be careful of those feelings. But Ehrenberg in the 70s, 1970s, was beginning to let herself respond emotionally to what she's picking up from her patient. And she made that the centerpiece of her work, to not be afraid of the feelings coming up. So here's a typical moment for her. Ronald, a young man in his 20s, was referred by a colleague after two years of treatment which seemed to have reached a stalemate. Despite acute somatic reactions to stress, including a severe colitis with subsequent hospitalizations, and a history of obesity in the past, he was, Ronald was not aware of great emotional distress except about his physical condition. He was zombie-like and detached. He claimed to have, quote, no feelings, had little to say, and wasn't sure why he was even coming to treatment. He would miss sessions and acted cynically as though he were saying, what's the difference anyway? This was his attitude in general towards work towards all relationships. You could call that his transference into this situation of therapy, of this cynical attitude, what's the use? There it is. And detachment. No feelings, he's not committed, nothing's going on. There's the transference. When, when we know it's a transference in this writing because he says it was his attitude in general towards work, towards all relationships. So naturally, there it is, coming to Ehrenberg. Now, look what she starts to do. <coughs> Sessions were characterized by a kind of vapidity. Gosh, I haven't heard that word forever. <laughs> it, I don't think it's very good. <laughs> when, when he did come, I tried to convey to Ronald his impact on me. Now this one sentence is like Ehrenberg's whole thesis that therapy for her 
the medium of therapy is that relationship, is that connection. That's where it's going to happen, or not. So, she says, I try to convey to him his impact on me. I insisted that although he seemed to be reluctant to be concerned as to whether our sessions were useful in any way, I was not. She's concerned, though he wasn't concerned. He seemed to be reluctant to be concerned as to whether our sessions were useful in any way. I was not. I also said that I did not like to feel useless, which is what I did feel in these vacuous sessions. And I wondered if he were aware of his impact on me. So, she is aware of the transference from him onto her, this detachment, and says, are you aware of what's happening here? I've got to tell you about me. Already, her using her emotions that way is part of the revolution in the field about what the therapist is supposed to do. This is what, and this is what's really important here. So he, when she said, are you aware of your impact on me? He seemed quite surprised and became curious by painstakingly following the minutest vic uh, vicissitudes of his reactions with me and mine to him, and mine to him, he seemed to become more responsive. He noticed that his stuporous detachment was, this, was itself a reaction to the situation, which instead of making him more invisible, had impact on me. He began to notice, because she was telling him, had impact on her. This was a revelation as far as he was concerned, this impact, and affected him greatly. Gradually, he began to get in touch with deep feelings of vulnerability, pain, sadness, anger. It evoked many associations to childhood, which had been extremely traumatic, including memories of scenes of his father, a chronic alcoholic, physically threatening his mother with a knife, and the terror the patient had experienced. He was able to experience with me the emotions he had not experienced then, as he told all this to me, but listen to this again. At times I commented how painful some of the experiences he reported sounded when I felt he was glossing over this, when he was minimizing this horror. I told him that. He reported that he was touched by the fact that I did not accept his own efforts to minimize the extent of his pain. Do you see how this is going back and forth? This is what is so crucial for her and what's coming up. You see, she's not letting him just get away with his transference, this detached vapidity. She is not letting him get away with its impact on her, nor is she letting herself get away with it. Now that's really important. Remember I told you the first 50 years all these therapists are very nervous about what's coming up in them. She is using that to not move away from herself. Think about it later. Talk to her own therapist about it. Not at all. There is the difference. So, the man who was untouchable and, quote, did not care was now very emotional, even passionate. He was able to describe a decision never to be vulnerable again, made out of anger and despair as a child, and a feeling that he would rather be dead. In the context of this growing sense of hope, and possibility based on his actual experience of our relationship, he described with great emotion a desire to someday have a family of his own, which was very different for this man. He was always reluctant, she said, about having children because he might expose them to what he had been exposed to. So here's how she summarizes this. I believe, this is in the, this is in, 
the 70s. I believe, the, in New York, I believe the fact that I engaged him the way I did was as responsive as I, oh, the way I did, and was as responsive as I had been, the fact that I did that, engaged him that way, responsive as I had been, was critical in this treatment. Some therapists fear that active engagement of the patient might foster some kind of pathological dependency. I think this example illustrates that often the therapist's responsiveness can facilitate a turning point in the work. Whatever the therapist's preference for technique, whatever technique, unless he or she can use his or her own aliveness to spark some life into the interaction, it sometimes will remain dead. The therapist must engage in some affective, emotional way. OK, so this is classic Ehrenberg. And I'll, I think I'll skip the second case of hers, which is definitely on this same issue. Because the, um, what she's trying to get past in the field back in the um, 1950s, an analyst in England, Margaret Little, wrote this about what was going on here. She said, to my mind, it is the question of a paranoid or phobic attitude toward the therapist's own feelings. Paranoid or phobic, fearful, attitude to the therapist's own feelings, which constitutes the greatest danger and difficulty in countertransference. The greatest difficulty. The very real fear of being flooded with feeling of any kind. Rage, anxiety, love in relation to one's patient and of being passive to it and at its mercy leads to an unconscious avoidance or denial by the therapist. Honest recognition, she goes on to say, of such feeling is essential to the therapeutic process. And the patient is naturally sensitive to any insincerity in his therapist and will inevitably respond to it with hostility. He will identify with the therapist in it as a means of denying his own feelings and will exploit it generally in every way possible to the detriment of his therapy. OK, so 50 years after Freud, this question of having the courage to know when and how to use your own feelings. The, the first example was he did not share any of that. He just saw, oh, brother, I'm on a mission to rescue her. Let me take a breath here. And so interesting where it eventually turned out. He, be, he, he noticed, or the, he and his patient got to her wanting him to rescue her rather than grapple with what she was going to do herself in the marriage. So it was good he could pause at that. So these, this dilemma of what to share, when to share, these are crucial issues in the field. Another New York analyst says, only by exposing himself or herself with the patient to the pain and dread and misery beyond those transferences. Let me give it to you again. Exposing yourself to the pain, dread, and misery beyond those transferences. Remember the transference of this nothing matters, why am I here, this vapidity, this ex beyond that. What is beyond that? But sometimes that's the first thing you're going to get. What attitude is coming toward me? 
Like, why am I here? It's hopeless anyway. That beginning transference of old attitudes that may be going on everywhere in that person's life. So, Wallstein says, the pain, the dread, and misery beyond those transferences. And that's why Ehrenberg is pointing them out. Do you know your imp the impact you're having on me? Are you aware of what's happening here? OK. So just to remind you that um, we're talking about a space. So let's say that here's the therapist, and here's, let's say, a woman patient, doesn't matter. And this is the space we're talking about. In that space, things are coming up in both people. I like to call that space, the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber called it the between. The psychoanalysts are calling it intersubjective reality, intersubjective between two subjects. I like to call it a relational reality, a relational unconscious, a relational psyche, and psyche means soul. So, a relational soul in this space? What is the implication of the soul not being in each person, but something that is alive in that space that all of a sudden, Ehrenberg is feeling something is trying to come into this space. So what? Let me give you an example, a brief example, from a recent situation I was in. I'm working with a woman close to my age, and um, I'd been having uh, some physical problems lately with my spine. I've been in pain and uh, worried about an old cancer I once had, and so she was aware of that. Because she saw me using a cane occasionally that I borrowed, and she came into that session with a bit of tears, saying, I thought you were dying. OK. And then all of a sudden, the subject of death and dying, I, I'm with her, but I'm just listening. I'm not saying anything yet. But there's still that space. I mean, you know when you're really there with someone, even though you're saying nothing, it contributes to the nature of that space I just drew. So here she goes. She says, you know, I've been thinking about our family's physician when he died. He actually, I was close with him, and he called me in to see him close to his death. And I'm thinking about the death of my father, who I was also quite close to. Now, now where is it going to go? And I'm thinking about my death, she says. Not mine, hers. And what I'll be saying goodbye to 
the mountains. My children, where I live, everything I love, Here is the imagination taking a subject, death, and like a dream, it's starting to elaborate this. And I won't go into it, but the famous scene in Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town, when Emily, who has died in childbirth, who is sitting in the graveyard with everybody else who's died, has the wish to go back to her home at age 12 for one more day. And that wish is granted. And they tell her, you shouldn't do it. It's all going to be overwhelming to you. She says, I've got to do it. I want to do it. See, I can never not tell this story. <laughs> I can't. And so she tries to contact her parents and but after a while, she is so moved by what she has to say to goodbye to. And that, to me, is the most beautiful part of the play. She starts saying goodbye to her picket fence, goodbye to the tree. How about goodbye to waking up and going to sleep? And it's like, oh, man. So that's what my patient was doing. What will I be saying goodbye to? On the other hand, like a dream, there is then the powerful wish in the midst of all of this to be deeply connected still. She's still alive. To be deeply connected comes in, like I noticed with the pains I'm having, that though I'm not dead yet, somehow the world looks more precious to me, if you can follow that. Like when you're not well, sometimes you look around and think, wow, I'm still alive even though I'm hurting. Otherwise, when I'm not hurting, I don't even think about it. So anyway, she thinks about a new relationship she has and being alive and said, oh, by the way, I did a painting recently. So the life spirit that was generated in talking about death, the beautiful, she relates this to her being, to her body, to life. It's just like when the imagination gets a hold of something and starts elaborating it. So I'm putting that piece out there about how is that going to be related to therapy for a second? As I say, I didn't say anything, hardly at all, just allowed the flow of this. Remind me, it reminds me that one of my favorite therapists, who's dead now, Winnicott in London, used to talk about taking notes as his patients were talking to him so he wouldn't say anything, <laughs> just to keep that space open. I love that. OK. So somehow I've got to link what I just told you about the imagination somehow. Now, because what is the problem that we're basically dealing with? about life, about life and death, about living. Huh. Winnicott, in his famous last book, Playing and Reality, says, you know, we might know something about treatment, but we hardly know anything about why the person is alive. What's life for? I know I can, I, we can say what treatment is for and about, but what's life for? So back in the Middle Ages, the mystic 
Jacob Boehm said, our life is as a fire dampened. Our life is as a fire dampened or as a fire shut up in stone. Remember Ehrenberg's first patient? Why am I here? Nothing. Nothing matters. Our life is as a fire shut up in stone. Dear children, he goes on, it must blaze and not remain smoldering, smothered. Historical faith is moldy matter. It must be set on fire. Historical faith is moldy matter. It must be set on fire. OK. The story I just told you was the fire. You saw the painting. That's part of the fire. It says, that's my body. That's my life. That's my relationship. Yes, I'll die one day, and then I'll say goodbye to all these things. That's fire. That's not just her persona talking to me. How do we further that? That's what Ehrenberg is about. She says, if I confront the transference, maybe we'll get deeper. OK. Pretty soon, I'm going to get so confused up here with everything lying around. <laughs> I, can, I can sense it coming. <laughs> and speaking of that good guy, Winnicott, he says, he's got a nice sentence here about all this. The potential space, that space between baby and mother, between child and family, between individual and society, between the individual and the world, between the client and the therapist, that space depends on experience which leads to trust. For that space to really work, there has to be trust in there. OK? It can be looked upon, that space, and what comes up in that space, as sacred to the individual. And it can be looked upon as to what comes up in there, like you just heard and saw in that painting, as sacred to the individual in that it is here, in that space, that the individual experiences creative living. Creative living. Not some of those dead transferences. OK. A sacred space. So going back to that link about the imagination, I am going to take you on a journey about getting past something in which an individual gets past something by using, write, by writing a poem. Now here's the situation. It concerns the famous novelist D.H. Lawrence. Lawrence at that time was living in Sicily with his wife. They were poor most of the time. And it was hot. It was a hot day in Sicily. And he needed some water. So he walks down to the fountain outside. And there he sees a snake that has come to drink some water. He says, I, I, he's standing there like a, a I'll, I'll, you know what he calls that? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll get to it. Oh, yes, he said, I like a second comer. What is that phrase? That sounds familiar. What is a sec is, does that phrase mean anything biblically or something? Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Oh, so but he says he is standing there like a second comer. Or to be born again. Or to be born again. Okay. Now, 
So if Lawrence simply told us the story, oh, so here's how the story, the story, not the poem, how the story ends. All of a sudden, he's standing there looking at the snake, sipping some water, and he has to wait, holding his pitcher, and it's hot as hell. He thinks, if I were a real man, I'd kill that snake. Transference. Transference. Something in the culture, if I were a real man, comes into his attitude. I'd, I'd kill him. So as the snake, he tells us in the story, begins to wind its way and re-enters a hole in the fountain on the side, the stone, he picks up a log, a stick, a big one, and throws it with all his might at this snake, who, who I think he misses, and it scurries into the hole, and he's left feeling, this is pathetic. <laughs> what I just did was pathetic. OK, that's the story. If you tell somebody a story, that's all you got, the events. But he decides to make a poem of that story. And we're back to the question, when the what happens when the imagination gets hold of something? What happens when a therapist's imagination gets hold of something? What are we supposed to do with that? Not just our feelings. What happens when our client's imagination gets hold of something? Listen to what happens when Lawrence's imagination gets hold of something. Because He's making a space between him and the snake and that morning. That space is so crucial. The poem flows into the space. So here it is. A snake came to my water trough on a hot, hot day, and I in pajamas for the heat to drink there in the deep, strange, scented shade of the, drake, of the great dark carob tree, I came down the steps with my pitcher and must wait, must stand and wait, for there he was at the trough before me. He reached down from a fissure in the earth wall in the gloom and trailed his yellow-brown slackness soft bellied down over the edge of the stone trough and rested his throat upon the stone bottom. And where the water had dripped from the tap in a small clearness, he sipped with his straight mouth, softly drank through his straight gums into his slack, long body, silent. Someone was before me at my water trough, and I, like a second comer, waiting. He lifted his head from his drinking as cattle do, and looked at me vaguely as drinking cattle do, <laughs> and flickered his two forked tongue from his lips and mused a moment, and stooped and drank a little more being earth brown, earth golden from the burning bowels of the earth, on the day of Sicilian July, with Etna smoking. Already something's coming in here. The volcano, the earth, earth brown, something's beginning to come in here. The voice of my education said to me, he must be killed. For in Sicily, the black, black snakes are innocent, the gold are venomous. And voices in me said, if you were a man, you would take a stick and break him now, finish him off. But must I confess how I liked him? How glad I was he had come like a guest 
inquire. This word guest has a long religious history. The guest who comes. How glad I was he had come like a guest and quiet to drink at my water trough and depart peaceful, pacified and thankless into the burning bowels of the earth. Was it cowardice? He's coming back to it. Was it cowardice that I dared not kill him? Was it perversity that I longed to talk to him? Was it humility to feel so honored? I felt so honored. And yet those voices, if you were not afraid, you would kill him. And truly, I was afraid. I was most afraid. But even so, honored still more, that he should seek my hospitality from out of the dark door of the secret earth. The dark door of the secret earth. What is that? It's not to answer that question. It's just to see what his imagination is trying to, is trying to create like a dream does. All of a sudden, we have the dark door of the secret earth. He drank enough and lifted his head dreamily as one who has drunken and flickered his tongue like a forked knight on the air, so black, seeming to lick his lips, and looked around like a god, unseeing into the air, and slowly turned his head, and slowly, very slowly, as if thrice a dream, proceeded to draw his slow length curving round and climb again the broken bank of my wall face. And as he put his head into that dreadful hole, and as he slowly drew up, snake easing his shoulders and entered further, a sort of horror, a sort of protest against his withdrawing into that horrid black hole, deliberately going into the blackness, and slowly drawing himself after, overcame me. Now his back was turned. I looked around, put down my pitcher, picked up a clumsy log, and threw it at the water trough with a clatter. I think it didn't hit him. But suddenly, that part of him that was left behind convulsed in undignified haste, writhed like lightning, and was gone into the black hole, the earth lipped fissure in the wall front, at which, this black hole, in the intense still noon, I stared with fascination. And immediately, I regretted it. I thought, how paltry, how vulgar, what a mean act. I despised myself and the voices of my accursed human education. And I thought of the albatross, you know, Coleridge's poem of he kills the albatross and then hell breaks loose on the board. And I thought of the albatross, and I wished he would come back, my snake, for he seemed to me again like a king, like a king in exile, uncrowned, in the underworld, now due to be crowned again. And here's how he ends it. And so, I love this ending. I missed my chance with one of the lords of life. And I have something to expiate, a pettiness. So once again, we have a transference. The voices of his education kill him. He catches it at least in the poem. He catches it. And when he can catch it, the voices of his education, he can go and let the imagination develop, like a dream, a whole other event about the underworld, about the darkness, about a lord of life. He didn't just tell the story to somebody. The story doesn't have it. His imagination has it. 
what does that have to do with our imagination, sitting there with patience? Because the person we're sitting with is not just who you're sitting with. He or she is more than he or she thinks he is. He's got a certain identity, but that's not the whole story. How do we get to who else that person is? Like, how do we get to who else that snake was? A lord of life? living in the underworld, a king about to be crowned? How do, does a, do we, as therapists, help someone get to who else they are? When the Spanish poet Jimenez asked himself that question, he wrote a very short poem. called I am not I. I am not I. Walking beside me whom I do not see, whom at times I manage to visit, and whom at other times I forget, the one who remains silent when I talk, the one who forgives sweet when I hate, the one who takes a walk when I am not. The one who will remain standing when I die. When his imagination gets hold of being more than he is. You don't have to take this literally. Just see what the imagination is doing. I am not I. I am this one walking beside me whom I do not see. Can I, as a therapist, know who is walking besides my patient who they don't see? It's crucial that I gradually begin to see who they don't see walking beside them. That's where the hope would be. Certainly, Ehrenberg began to get a clue that beneath that person's sullen, why am I here, was somebody else. Can we get that clue? Whom at other times I forget, the one who remains silent when I talk. Can I, as therapist, know who's silent as I'm listening to my patient? Who's the one who's silent? The one who forgives, sweet, when I hate. The one who takes a walk where I am not, the one who will remain standing when I die. Who else could come into that space when I'm sitting with you? Who else am I talking to? For example, this is a, a, a small example. I'm working with a woman in her early 40s who's going through a, a divorce. And what was really important in what we did in the, f haven't seen her for a long time, in the first few months, is that we both got aware that when she begins to get anxious and overwhelmed, she kind of goes up to her head and starts trying to figure things out what she should do. And she really appreciated the fact when we saw that, that she could just come back down and just kind of sit here with me. And I had to be aware that I didn't go up there with her because she had lots of questions. How should I handle this divorce? And what about my daughter and all of this? And I, after a while, I thought, no, no. I don't want to do that. Let's not do that. And when we both could descend into just sitting here, and she got quiet. She said, whoa, this is good. I think I know what I want to do. I can't figure that out from here. So we had done some of that. 
What I also knew from her history, and this kind of became like a symbol to me, she was a foster kid in several foster homes with her sister. And between about the ages of 8 and 12 in this one particular foster home, the foster family had a son, an older son of theirs, and the, and the two girls were, you know, maybe 11 and 9. And their son, a teenager, almost every night would come into their bedroom and hit both of them for some years. And they never knew exactly when he would come in. And somehow one of their teachers, aware of the bruises, got Child Protective Services involved, and the foster family said, if you say a word about this, you're out of here. You're out of here. And so they didn't. OK, I knew that story. And somehow, I would sometimes, when she would get a little bit overwhelmed with this divorce and how things were proceeding, I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm reminded when you begin to feel a bit in danger of you and your sister being in that room and not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing what to do. I would occasionally mention it because it would, it would rise up in me of, oh, there we are again. And it just seemed like an, an embodiment and a memory. Now it was inside me as, there it is, like a dream saying, this is really important what happened. And so in this particular session, she came in. And to me, she sounded much surer of herself than I had heard her for quite a while about the divorce, about her daughter, about a new relationship, about where she would uh, live. And I decided to take a risk and raise the question of possible termination, or at least a space, at least. So I just was feeling it. And I said something like, you know, given how well things are going now, and they had been going like that for a bit, I said, you know, we could meet less often, if you'd like. Or we could stop meeting, and you could call me if ever something came up that you needed to work on, and I would get you in right away. So I don't usually take it from me that way. I just felt like doing that. Now, again, we're talking about the therapist being able to follow their own feelings and sometimes trust them. So I trusted that. And she smiles and looks at me straight in the eyes and says, we've got to talk about this, said in an excited way. We've got to talk about this. She said, you are trusting my capacity to be safe now. And I know if I get into trouble, I can lock that door now. The door that that boy came in? I can lock that door now. You're trusting me that I can be safe now, and I know it, she said. I can. I can lock that door so neither that boy or anyone else can just come in and hurt me. You could say she was closing one door, locking one door, and opening another to life, to relationship, to a new start, to a new beginning. And the relationship as the place where it's happening, the place where it's is Darlene Ehrenberg, the relationship is the place where it's happening. We've got to talk about that. You are, you are trusting my capacity to be safe now. So I trusted bringing up the subject. Listen, if I had to summarize the most important point in this lecture, I would say, if you're a therapist, 
that everything you've learned about listening to your patient also applies to you. That you sitting there, there are two patients in the room now, your patient and you, and you have to listen so attentively to what's coming up in you as you do and as you've been trained to do and learned how to do with your patient. So when Ehrenberg says, do you know the impact you're having on me? She listened to that impact. I don't like feeling useless, she says. You don't, you don't, seem, you don't seem to care about this therapy. I do, she says. I do. Listening, listening, listening. So, and you don't have to know in advance exactly as you listen to yourself, what exactly this is and where it's going. Like when I wanted to bring up possible termination with my patient, I, I didn't know where that would go. I just thought I'd try it because it felt, it felt right in the moment. You don't have to know exactly. So much in the early years of therapy and of psychoanalysis was you, you remain silent until you really know you know it five times what's really happening, and you're quiet until the sixth time that it happens again, and then you can say something about it. So this is not that. And, but you have to be able to tolerate a certain not knowing. And here we have the famous English poet, John Keats, who defined negative capability. And he defined it in a letter to his two brothers in one sentence. When you are capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, when you are capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason, if you are capable of being in that place, that not knowing place. And to quote the 20th century philosopher Hannah Arendt, by the way, there's been an important biographical film out recently in our town, Vita Activa, about her and her writings about Eichmann and about the Second World War. And but she has one sentence I like. It's about this not knowing and about what, what is called the present as opposed to the past and to the future. The present, she says, is a gap in the continuum of time, a gap a gap that appears to the human mind as an abyss. A gap that appears to the human mind as an abyss when there is no longer a bridge of inherited concepts to traverse it. When you can find the present as an abyss, when you don't know exactly what's happening, how you're going to get over it, when Ehrenberg says, do you know your impact on me? This therapy is important to me. It's not to you. Where are you coming from here? She doesn't know how she's going to get over it, through it. She hasn't seen that five times and is now saying it for the sixth time after she thought about it five times. No, it's now. Trusting that. 
So the interesting thing about a talk like this is that the other part of the talk is what is happening in you. And that we've got, oh, at least 10 minutes. It's almost 1.15. If anybody has to leave before 1.25 or so, please do so. But I so am interested if anything touched you about what I was saying because I never really know the other side of what I'm saying. <laughs> what is landing and, you know, what you're hearing. So, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather hear that first. Like, did anything move you or touch you or that you find now you're really thinking about something as opposed to my having to say more back to a question? I mean, so if we could start with that, if anybody has something they could say to me, back to me about what came in for you. What, did you, wh what do you think I was trying to do? What landed on you or in you? So I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. <laughs> I don't know. I just get it. Thank you. Okay. And um, also, sometimes people really uh, find, find a hard time in talking in a group like that. So because this feedback is so important to me, I'd like to put my email up on the board in case somebody wants to just say, I was there, and this is what I, this is what I thought. It's just Michael and then a dot, G-E-I-S, at Gmail. So if somebody would like to, dot com. So believe me, I will appreciate it. Hey, Noah.